Well, I forgot to post a little warning that I was going to go live at 10 o'clock. So I'll do it right now. I'll, I'm going to go live right now. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to another installment of uh, Low Magic. It's all in your head. You just have no idea how big your head is. Hope you're enjoying your weekend so far and uh, your, your long weekend. And uh, I hope you're relaxed and ready for uh, uh, a little short visit to, uh, to the book. This is book four, or excuse me, this is chapter four, called Family Secrets. And it starts with a, an epigram, which is a quote from Marcel Mauss from his General Theory of Magic. It says, In parts of Melanesia, where matriline is the rule, magic is, is inherited from father to son. In Wales, it seems that mothers hand it down to sons, while fathers bequeath it to daughters. In societies where voluntary secret societies for men play an important role, the association of magicians and the secret society usually overlap. Some people in the magical community place a great deal of importance on their magical ancestry. This is not surprising because the romance and mythos of our spiritual art is certainly enhanced by the thought that we might in fact be a special breed set apart from ordinary people by the very blood in our veins. I believe that, in and of itself, this attitude can be harmless enough. After all, who of us wouldn't, want, wouldn't like to think that we were, even by tradition, descended from a Merlin or a Morgan Le Fay or a Cagliostro or an Aleister Crowley? Taken too seriously, however, such preoccupation with magical bloodlines can easily seduce us into blindly abandoning our common sense and embracing a form of magical elitism as foolish and dangerous as any name-your-own-supremacy. Please, don't misunderstand me. I fully recognize the fact that there are a few of us who actually have parents who studied and practiced magic or witchcraft, and that they too may have had parents who did the same. For most of us, however, the magic we've inherited from our parents or grandparents is something less overtly magical than that determined by our family's preoccupation with the generational covens or satanic cults or secret initiatory societies. In fact, I believe that we can discover more about the magical blood of our ancestors by simply examining their lives and characters than we can by analyzing their professed spiritual interests. I'd wager that if each of us gave it a little thought, we could find the magician in our parents and grandparents and be able to trace that magic, whether for good or ill, to our own lives and personalities. I certainly can. As a matter of fact, if you wish to truly become wise and well-rounded magician, you will sooner or later have to come to terms with both the good and the evil locked in the DNA of your own family secrets. With your permission, I'd like to share a couple of stories from my magical family tree. Perhaps you'll be able to see some parallels in your own life. If not, you might at least learn a bit more about me. 
My mother was a fundamentalist Christian who took perverse pride in the fact that she did not know, nor did she care to learn, the history or tenets of Christianity, even her own brand. She did not read, let alone study, the Bible. Childlike faith was the sole virtue she boasted would get her into heaven. In her mind, curiosity and education would only open the door to the devil's wiles and tempt her to doubt the one true way of faith that was pounded into her as a child growing up on the unforgiving prairie of western Nebraska. This devotional focus could have been a powerful spiritual tool in her life if it were not for the fact that there was not an object to her devotion. She did not seem particularly devoted to Jesus or interested in the spiritual significance of the passion of his life. She was thoroughly content with the concept that if she unquestioningly believed that he, as a historical character, died on the cross, came back to life three days later, and then flew up into the sky 40 days after that, then she would go to heaven. And everyone who didn't believe those things would be justly punished in a blazing hell for eternity. Even as a child, I believe she delighted more in the thought of the damnation of unbelievers than in the promise of sweet salvation for believers. Belief in such doctrines isn't necessarily a cause for criticism or condemnation. Indeed, I've known many people that hold very similar religious beliefs. People with loving hearts that hold very similar, uh, excuse me, people with loving hearts who possess a deep compassion for their families, friends, neighbors, and communities. But with all due respect to the woman who brought me into this dimension, I'm sad to report that my mother was not one of these people. For her, this small exercise in intolerant religious absolutism only freed her to focus her entire energies upon the one and only object of her true spiritual devotion herself. She was supernaturally psychic and possessed a power of personality so magnetic that it captured and dominated everyone around her. This made her initially attractive to others and in social environments very popular. Time after time, during her 94-year incarnation, casual acquaintances became her unsuspecting victims, falling voluntarily under her spell, only to later find themselves stung, paralyzed, and hopelessly entangled in her web of emotional servitude. She was a charismatic dictator who ironically had no master plan other than to create explosions of emotional turmoil in the lives of those around her and then to draw energy from all that turmoil. After 33 years of suffering her soul-draining dramas, my father died at the age of 62. Twenty-three years later, the same fate awaited the second husband. Her magic touch would also prove fatal to the health, careers, marriages, and relationships of scores of relatives, friends, and well-meaning strangers. Ironically, she had at times a great sense of humor, and humor is the inheritance of 
from her I most treasure. Humor continues to help me cope with and hopefully transmute the darker magic she bequeathed me. Here are a few passages from the eulogy I delivered at her funeral. I may sound a bit disrespectful in the short clip below, but the pastor and the congregation of her church certainly didn't think so. They knew my mother too well. The laughter in the sanctuary was a healthy discharge of emotion for all of us. And this is my actual eulogy. A son's eulogy delivered at Christ Presbyterian Church in Lakewood, California, January 26, 2008. I'm sure not all mothers are vampires, but mine was. I sucked her milk for less than a year, then she sucked my blood for the next 59. Up to a point, I think it's part of the natural order of things. We all live off each other in one way or another. If someone really needs to be nourished with my energy, I'm happy to bleed a little for them. But I really resent it when they don't really drink my blood, but instead spill it all over the floor. And I'm sad to say in her 94 years, mom spilled a lot of people's blood all over the floor. <laughs> I've got to, I got to do a little uh, diversion here or a digression. When I started this eulogy in, ch in the church, when I first started, people went, <laughs> you could, you could hear gasps. And the, the, the minister, the pastor was sitting, uh, right up uh, front of the sanctuary and he started to squirm and then as I went on people started to chuckle a little bit and then before this was over there was they were roaring with laughter and everyone felt so good okay I'm just that's not in the book I'm just telling you that I'll continue my eulogy Please don't get me wrong. Mom loved people. But she hated all other living things. You'd never catch her petting a dog or stroking a cat. She strove to kill all insects, both inside and outside the house. She didn't even care too much for flowers because of the chance they might harbor an insect. You never wanted to take her to a restaurant to which you ever intended to return. She ran waiters and waitresses ragged, and if she didn't like the food, she would often call them to the table, take the food out of her mouth, and say, Honey, would you look at this? Would you eat that? She would then try to get them to eat some of of it before sending it back. Toward the end of the meal, she always loudly announced, within earshot of the haggard waitress, that she didn't believe in tipping, <laughs> and she always stole the napkins. To say she was strong-willed and self-centered would be a colossal understatement. If I were to use the title of a popular song to describe the character of this amazing person, it would have to be Frank Sinatra's My Way. As a matter of fact, when she was in her late 70s, she demonstrated how true this was by causing herself and her entire party to be kicked out of a Frank Sinatra concert in Long Beach because she refused to stop loudly chatting with her friends during his performance. Sadly, I must give her mixed reviews as far as her parenting skills were concerned. 
she subscribed to the old school philosophy that states that a mother should never whip a child unless she's red in the face in the throes of a violent blind rage and completely out of control. These beatings were perhaps tame compared to some stories of abuse. Once, however, as I struggled to escape a paddling, she missed her mark and hit me in the head with the edge of a wooden paddle. I guess it scared her pretty badly to see me stunned blind and bouncing off the furniture. But I'm all grown up now, and I've forgotten all about it. <laughs> Because I was the second-born child, I personally escaped many of the more severe and damaging effects her maternal learning curve visited upon my older brother Mark in the six years before, of life before I was born. But Mark's all grown up now, too, and I'm sure he's forgotten all about it. Mark wrote a book, too. Okay. Yes. Lucinda Myrtle Duquette was quite a character. Strong-willed, charismatic, wicked, and unforgettable. A few months before she died, I wrote her this little poem. Perhaps we were neighbors. Perhaps we were kin. Perhaps we were husband and wife. Perhaps we were friends. Perhaps we were foes. Perhaps we took each other's life. No matter the bonds we bring from the past, or, once, or what we once were to each other, whether parent or spouse, sister or brother, this time around, you're our mother. So as this part of our lives draws near to a close and the stage stu soon will be set for another, let's kiss and let's laugh and set fire to the past and forgive and forget one another. The second part of this chapter is uh, a few words about my father. And I think that's where we'll pick up uh, tomorrow. Uh, you may not think that this has a great deal to do with uh, low magic, but indeed it does. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day, the rest of your weekend, and we will see you uh, tomorrow, same time, same place on Facebook. Until then, be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.